Okay, so picture this. You're a kid, and you've got all these amazing stories in your head, right? But actually getting those stories out onto paper, it feels like you're trying to, like, nail jello to a wall. Right. It's just not working. Okay. And that... That's kind of what it's like to deal with dysgraphia. Yeah. And that's what we're diving into today. Because, you know, you gave us this this big stack of articles all about autism, and we noticed dysgraphia kept popping up, yeah. like again and again. So today, we're going way beyond just, you know, messy handwriting right. to really uncover why these two things, autism and dysgraphia, seem to go hand in hand so often. Yeah. And, and what it all means for, you know... <laughs> For people who are who are navigating both of those things. It's fascinating mm -hmm. because so many people, when they think dysgraphia, they just think, oh, that's just bad handwriting. Mm -hmm. And they dismiss it like, yeah. oh, you know, just try harder and your handwriting will get better. Right. But it's so much more complex than that. It's like telling somebody who's who's having trouble riding a bike, well, you just haven't tried hard enough. Mm -hmm. Right, right. There's There's a reason there's something else going on. Exactly. There's a whole neurological process at play there. It's like it's like saying, um, like judging uh, a race car's engine just by looking at like a scratch on the paint job, right. you know, <laughs> there's there's so much more going on under the hood. So let's let's pop, pop the hood on dysgraphia, shall we? Let's do it. So our sources were very clear. This is not just about messy letters. What are some of the core features that really define dysgraphia? So dysgraphia is is really interesting because it's a neurological difference that impacts the mechanics and the thought processes behind writing. Okay. So we're talking about things like slow writing speed, mm. difficulty forming letters correctly. Even even some people experience pain while writing. Right. You know, imagine the frustration of of knowing what you want to say, yeah. but your hands just won't cooperate. Right. And that's got to be that's got to be so frustrating. And and this is this is where it gets really interesting because uh. our sources kept pointing to this this really intriguing overlap between dysgraphia and autism. Yeah. It's, it's like finding this hidden passageway between two rooms that you didn't realize were connected. Right. So so what's the deal with this connection? So so think of it like a detective's clue board. Right. We've got all these different clues and we're trying to piece it together. Yeah. One of the, the biggest links, I think, is fine motor skills. Okay. Both autism and dysgraphia can involve difficulty controlling those really small hand muscles. That we need to do things like like hold a pencil. Yeah. Or form letters. Right. Um, but it goes beyond just the physical act of writing as well. Right, because we know that. Sensory yeah. processing is such a huge part of the autism experience. Exactly. And our sources really emphasize how that sensory aspect can make writing particularly challenging. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, you know, for, some, for someone with autism, even just the feeling of a pencil on paper yeah. or the texture yeah. of the paper itself can be overwhelming. Oh. So when you're already dealing with the challenges of trying to get your thoughts down, and then you add on top of that this this kind of sensory input. It just makes it that much more challenging. Right. It's like it's like trying to it's like trying to write a beautiful sentence. Yeah. While you're sitting on a bed of nails. Right. It's, it's just it's just not really conducive to to creativity. And then on top of that, our sources also highlighted this thing called visual motor integration. Yes. Which I have to admit I hadn't really considered before. Yeah. And it's, it's something that a lot of us take for granted. Mm -hmm. But it's that coordination mm -hmm. between what our eyes see mm -hmm. and how our hands move. Right. And it's essential for things like copying letters, mm -hmm. maintaining spacing. And for someone with dysgraphia, this process can feel like, I don't know, like trying to draw a straight line while riding a roller coaster. Right. It's just not going to happen. No wonder it can be such a struggle. And then yeah. you add on top of all of that the executive function piece. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's our brain's own personal project manager. Exactly. It's a big one. Huge. Because it affects so many aspects of writing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Executive function is crucial for planning, organizing your thoughts, sequencing actions. Right. All things that are absolutely essential for writing. And you know what's really interesting about that? Yeah. Is that... Our research showed that working memory training, yeah. which is you know a, a key component of executive function, right. can actually lead to improvements in writing fluency for some individuals with dysgraphia. Wow. So that's huge. That is huge. So you've got somebody who might be dealing with autism, dysgraphia. They might be facing this perfect storm of challenges yeah. from the sensory overload. Yeah. The motor control difficulties to to trouble actually organizing their thoughts on it's, paper. 
It's like they're trying to bake a cake while juggling flaming bowling pins and somebody's like blasting an air horn in their ear. It's just it's just too much. And it, it makes me think about um, a friend of mine. She has a daughter who's autistic. OK. And, you know. She's incredibly articulate. She's a, you know, she can tell you anything. But you ask her to like write something down. Yeah. And it's it's like she just hits this wall. Yeah. So how how do you even begin to mm-hmm. uh, like untangle all of that? How do professionals actually pinpoint dysgraphia when It's not always obvious. You can't just look at someone's handwriting and be like, "Aha, dysgraphia." Right. And that's and that's a great point because it really highlights that dysgraphia often is like an iceberg. There's so much more beneath the surface. Ooh, I like that. Than just what you see. Mm-hmm. So while while messy handwriting can definitely be a clue, it's really about looking at the whole picture. And and particularly for someone with autism, it might show up as, you know, as you were saying, this this extreme reluctance to write. Um, almost like they're facing a brick wall instead of a blank page. Right. Like they've got those stories. They're 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 locked inside. Yeah. But the the express lane is is Close for construction. Exactly. So how do we how do we help them find a detour? So that's where specialists like occupational therapists, educational psychologists, they really come in because they they can use specific assessments Mm -hmm. to differentiate dysgraphia from other learning challenges that might be going on. And and really, you know, look at each individual and their unique strengths and needs. So it's less about labeling and more about really understanding the individual's own like brain wiring, exactly. right? And then once once you've once you've kind of identified, okay, this this is dysgraphia. Mm-hmm. What are some of the like? What are some of the tools in the toolbox? What are the interventions that are available? So there's there's a whole toolbox, as you said, of interventions available, and and each tool is really designed to to target a specific challenge. Right. So for example, right. occupational therapy, right. and and this isn't just for kids. This is this is something that can be helpful for people of all ages. Right. Um, but occupational therapy can really help to build those foundational fine motor skills. Yeah, I, I used to think occupational therapy was like <laughs> just learning how to tie your shoes <laughs> and use scissors. Right. But it's it's clearly so much more than that. It's it's so much deeper than that because occupational therapists can work with people on hand strength finger dexterity, hand-eye coordination, all of which are so critical for writing. Oh, absolutely. Um, And one technique that they use is called handwriting without tears, which which utilizes multi-sensory activities Mm. and specific letter formation techniques to really try to make writing a little bit less daunting. That's awesome. And and speaking of, kind of, you know, leveling the playing field. Yeah. Technology offered some really exciting possibilities here. Absolutely. And I know there's always this debate around assistive tech being cheating, but honestly, if it helps somebody express themselves more freely, who are we to judge? I completely agree. Technology is not about replacing a skill. It's about providing alternative pathways Mm. to success. Yes, I love that. And for someone with dysgraphia, it can be truly transformative. It's It's like having this personalized toolkit for communication. Yeah, so what are some of the, like, what are some of the specific technologies that that can be real game changers in this area? It's like we're giving them the magic quill, right? That finally writes the way their brain thinks. What are some of those tools? So there are specially designed pens and grips, right. you know, yeah. ones that are ergonomically shaped. So it makes holding a writing instrument way more comfortable. Oh, OK. For some people, it's like the difference between like using a medieval torture device and a perfectly balanced paintbrush, you know? Oh. And then there's speech-to-text software, which can be completely revolutionary for people. Yeah, it's like having a personal stenographer, except instead of, like, dictating a telegram, you're composing a blog post yeah. or even, like, writing a screenplay. Exactly. So cool. Are there Are there other ways we can support people with dysgraphia, even without those, like, you know, fancy gadgets and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I think the simplest solutions can have the biggest impact. Like we can provide extended time for writing assignments right. or allow students to type their work instead of handwriting it mm-hmm. or even just break down like really large writing tasks into smaller, less overwhelming chunks. Right, right. It's all about reducing that cognitive load. Totally. And creating a supportive environment. Yeah, because for someone with dysgraphia facing a blank page, it can feel like being asked to climb Mount Everest mm. before breakfast. Right, exactly. You got to give them the right gear and like a good breakfast burrito first, yeah. you know? And for individuals specifically with autism who also have dysgraphia, 
our sources highlighted sensory integration therapy. That, that can be really helpful. Right, because remember how we were talking about how sensory sensitivities can be amplified in autism? Yeah, yeah. Sensory integration therapy can actually help desensitize a person to those triggers to try and create a calmer, more focused writing experience. Okay, so it's like it's like fine-tuning the sound system like in a recording studio. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, to filter out all the distractions and let those creative melodies really shine through. I love that analogy. You know, this whole deep dive has really opened my eyes to something that our sources emphasized, and that's the emotional impact of dysgraphia. Yeah. Especially for those on the autism spectrum. Right. It's not just about, you know, penmanship. Yeah. It's about it's about the ability to express yourself. Exactly. To connect with other people through writing. Imagine imagine having all of these incredible stories, ingenious ideas, you know, side splitting jokes, but really struggling to share those things in writing. Mm. It can be incredibly isolating, especially for people who maybe already face social challenges. Yeah, it's like it's like being at a party, a really vibrant party and and you're you're yearning to join all these conversations that are happening around you, but the words just they get lost in translation somehow. Yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. So what's the, what's the most important thing to remember if we're, if we're interacting with someone with dysgraphia, particularly someone on the autism spectrum? Yeah, I think the most important thing to remember is that their writing doesn't reflect their intelligence or their potential at all. Right, right. Dysgraphia is a difference in processing, not a deficit in ability. Mm -hmm. So focus on their strengths, provide the support that they need, and create that space for their unique voice to be heard. Yeah. Because everyone's story is unique and it's valuable. And sometimes we just need to get a little creative in helping those stories unfold. Beautifully said. I love that. So the next time you encounter someone with dysgraphia, remember, it's not just about the writing. It's about understanding the amazing way their mind works and finding ways to celebrate the symphony of their thoughts. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. We hope you'll keep exploring these important topics long after the episode ends. Until next time.